All right, and we're live. <laughs> Happy Monday. How are you guys? All right, today's hot topic is all about crate training. So we're going to help you with that. But before we get started, let me know, where are you guys tuning in from? Where, where are you guys at? We, I'm in I'm in Western New York, and it is a major storm out there right now. We're talking thunder, lightning. Allison made me go out and, and film something for you guys. So. <laughs> we had to do it. Michelle, I noticed it looks a little darker behind you for being in the middle of the day. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely super. It's like the eerie type of storm. It is. It's dark. It's lightning. It's it's blowing in, in rain and rain in uh. buckets. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm here for you. If you have to, like, if your power goes out or something, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, hopefully that doesn't happen, but all right, let's see. Um, I think we're ready to, uh, to hop in here. Oh, Peg is from Springton, Texas. Sammy and Jonah from St. Louis. Good morning, guys. Welcome. Welcome. Awesome. All right. So Hot topic, crate training. We were actually just helping a couple of students over at pro level with this. This is one of those things that you you bring home a puppy and you're hoping to be able to safely secure them in their crate, but maybe it's not going so well because maybe they've never been introduced to it. The breeder might not have, it might not have been part of their thing. So we're gonna help you today. We're gonna talk about the things that you should and shouldn't be doing and how to positively work on this with your pups today. When did you um when did you start crate training Lincoln? Allison? Right away, right from the yeah. beginning. Uh, he he was a really small pup, and he was in a pretty big crate. Um, he didn't seem to mind it, and we didn't really have any potty accidents in there, so it went pretty well. Um, but you know, I I really feel like crate training can be really hard on the human, almost harder than potty training because you've got that element of sometimes the dogs are in a little bit of distress or whining and none of us like to hear that oh, no. so i feel like crate training is one where people really um you know want to get some help and i'm glad that we're able to provide that yeah yeah it, it's something that it takes time for some pups other pups take to it right away and some pups are like i need a little extra help so for those guys i think that um if you have one of those puppies today's lessons will really be beneficial yeah. for you yeah you know, I did get lucky with Lincoln in terms of his early, you know, adaptation to the crate, but he's almost three and we still do crate training games just yeah. as part of our kind of regimen. If we do some training, we do some enrichment stuff. We do some hide and seek. We'll just kind of do a bunch of skills in the crate, close the door, off I go back in the crate. You know, there's one right there that he sleeps in as kind of his normal mom's working. I know Pickles gets to have a bed and I just have Lincoln in his crate. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Both we both we both got them behind us. But you know, it's, the crate train is the kind of thing where you put a lot of work into it at the beginning when the dogs are first getting used to it. But it doesn't necessarily stop. It just you don't need quite as much effort as uh, as they get older. But we definitely keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about why we don't necessarily need to get get rid of it quite yet. <laughs> let's talk about the reasons for it. Really, um, before we do that. Again, welcome to our, our viewers. Um, for those of you guys that are um, new to our channel or new inside our groups, welcome, welcome. We're excited to have you guys here and help you on your training journey. Um, if you haven't joined the Facebook group, Puppy Training with Michelle Lennon, definitely recommend that you do so. Uh, we do a lot of fun things in there. A lot of informative uh, you know, resources are shared. So you can always use like the search tool and type in a keyword and you'll find a lot of uh, topics that pop up that our comments is the team are, are first. We actually have a team of people that help in that group, um, which I feel like makes us a little different than other groups that you may be in. The professionals are hanging out in here. We're active and our comments are always first if you're if you're wondering where the sound piece of advice is. Not that the other members aren't contributing awesome advice as well, but you might be, um, you know, you just might be interested in seeing what the team has to say. I know you wish that there was other groups who had that same kind of professional answer, whether it's like, I really need to understand this plant that I'm working on, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you can get a lot of great advice from other plant 
you know, lovers on, on uh, Facebook, but can I get just one professional, anybody, just a sentence or two to kind of guide me in the right direction. <laughs> so I really, I really um, hope that people appreciate, and I know they do, they say it all the time, uh, that, yeah. that professional answer that comes with every question in this group. Yeah. Yeah. We have an awesome group, awesome team to help us too. All right. Here's the deal guys. Um, People ask us all the time, especially, you know, we have a lot of viewers that are watching from outside the U.S. And sometimes the crate training situation is, is they don't do that. They don't, you know, it's it's kind of either frowned upon. I know there's some countries actually it's banned, which I'm shocked, to be honest with you, because crate training for me is um, it's a it's a life skill. It's a place to keep your puppy safe when you can't supervise them and they are eager to get into things, especially our puppies who explore the world with their mouths. So it's a place to, to keep them safe at home and in the car when you travel. This is ideally where they should be in a, in a vehicle is in some sort of crate. It's really helpful when we're working on potty training so that they don't just have free roam all over the place because the more room to roam, the more their system processes the more frequently they're going to need to go out and or if you're not watching them, the more accidents they're going to have. Um, this is also a place to help them learn to, to soothe or self-soothe just to kind of settle and relax. Many dogs um, find it comforting to go into a, a cozy place and, and relax, especially if they're scared, say company comes over and they're like, oh my gosh, this is a little overwhelming for you or overwhelming for me. You might find them going into their crate for comfort. And honestly, like we said at the beginning, it's a life skill. Um, we find, I mean, my guy's here, you know, Pickles, he's, he's back here. Um, he is four. He still loves to run to his crate. And if I pick up my keys to go somewhere, he knows he's going in his crate. He loves it. Uh, Wesley, my standard poodle's three. He still goes in the crate. And if Harper, um, my great Dane, had a, a crate that she would fit in, um, she would be in there. We, we actually had one that was like a four foot by four foot kind of like kennelly pen type thing and she would love to run to that um we had to take it down for because we moved but <laughs> um but yeah she would totally run to that as well allison did you want to mention you know why during the lifetime of a of a dog here that we would still use or what we would still use it for Yes, we have heard from our students um, or, you know, people who have kind of followed our crate training methodology, how helpful it was um, when they've encountered something kind of unplanned happening. So there was one student who um, had to evacuate due to some wildfires and she had a beagle. And when she went to the shelter, they would not accept dogs unless the dogs were comfortable in the crate. The dogs couldn't be, you know, kind of free roaming in the area where people were sleeping. Um, you know, they could get into trouble. They could disturb people. And so they said, if your dog can be comfortable in the crate, your dog can stay here and you can stay here. If they are not, then we can't have you. Hotels have had some of the similar policies of, um, you know, they're very open to, to pets, but they need to be crate trained. Um, and I also had the experience with another dog yeah. that, um, oh, yeah. Lincoln has something to say with another dog who had to fly. Um, we were uh, living overseas and we had to fly him. And obviously he had to be in a crate. He was too big to be in the cabin. So there's a lot of different reasons for it. And it's really important to, to work on that ahead of time so that they're comfortable. Because can you imagine how scary those situations are to begin with? But then introducing a new tool. So, yeah. One student had told us um, the crate is like the bedroom that is movable. Right. You know, it's just a place that they can move that move that around either to different places that they go or, like you said, in an emergency. Um, did you mention recovery from from surgeries and things? <laughs> yes, that's right. And that is something that um, we experienced with Lincoln is, you know, definitely we're not the kind of people who are like no beds ever. You know, there's certainly a time and a place when you might invite your pup into bed if that's something that you want to do. It's not required, but it's also not like forbidden. But, you know, one of the things we recommend is getting past the potty training stage, the chewing stage, and any kind of surgery, because that crate is so helpful when the puppy is recovering from surgery. And, you know, you said something once um, that was kind of this light bulb moment for me in terms of that is that, you know, we might think, oh, we're going to be gone for a little while. We want to give them some space to move around. The more space that they have to kind of move around, they could pace out of anxiety, they could kind of wander back and forth, they're not settling. 
it may not be a very comfortable situation for them, but the crate really helps them be like, well, you know what? There's nothing else going on in here. I guess I'll just take a nap. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, do you have a room with a comfortable recliner or do you have an entire shopping mall? What What's going to be more comfortable for you to actually sleep? So that was kind of an aha moment of the importance of the crate when you're gone. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it is. It's just a, a peace of mind, too. Um, I was telling our students last week, um, I have seen singed tongues from dogs that have chewed on electrical cords because they had free roam. I've seen the damage that a dog can do when they are stressed. You know, they're they're stressed and anxious, so they're trying to kind of scramble and find things to do to self-soothe, chewing on molding, destruct, you know, chewing the couches. Um, like I said, chewing on, you know, electrical cords, things like that. So mm-hmm. keeping the dog safe in your absence is is critical, I think. It's um, yeah. you know, it's so important. I wanted to um, address this from Maple88. You can definitely ask questions here. We oh, yeah. will definitely take questions. We're gonna do a little bit more of our presentation first, and then um, we'll go back through and, and answer all of these questions that are coming up. So feel free to just pop some questions in as we're chatting and we'll get to them. Yeah, yeah. You're right, um, it's a loon channel, like a fidget toy, but in a dog's mind. Yeah, they're trying to find something to kind of keep them keep them uh, busy so that they don't stay anxious and they do, they end up chewing on things. So, <clears throat> okay. So we get the question all the time then. All right, Michelle. All right, Allison, if you want us to crate train, what kind of crate should we be using? Ideally, we should be using something like the plastic crate or, or even the metal crate. I definitely don't use these soft sided crates for our puppies. <clears throat> Maybe older dogs, who are going to agility competitions or rally obedience or something like that. But these are not great for travel. This would not keep a dog safe if you had to slam on the brakes. Um, These crates here, the plastic and the the metal, those ones are more designed for, actually they have some really high impact ones for for travel purposes. But Mm -hmm. I, over the years have started to transition from, I used to use the metal ones all the time, but then I found that the dogs really they were getting a little more anxious in them because they rattle the tray in the bottom can sound a little harsher on their with their nails scratching at it and the they're kind of hard to clean honestly if you have to clean up a let's say blowout there they get pretty messy um these crates the plastic ones are a little cozier a little quieter um they're easier to clean and these are generally the ones that you know the airlines will recommend for travel purposes mm-hmm. as well. So the soft-sided crate, not so much. We have potential for accidents to just kind of seep right through. Um, dogs, puppies can just scratch at the screen material, rip holes in it, and then jump out or escape out. Could you imagine driving down the road and all of a sudden there's like a puppy on your, your middle console? <laughs> that wouldn't yeah. be safe. Very distracting. We have the metal crate and you're right. It has, it just, it jingles and it, you know, it, it kind of moves a lot. And by the time we kind of thought about maybe the plastic one, Lincoln had already adjusted to it, but we definitely have like a rug underneath it. And he's graduated to having a little bit of softness inside it. So we tried to kind of buffer that a little bit, but when he was a young puppy, um, we couldn't have anything in it because he would chew it. Yeah. Um, as far as as far as the benefits or pros and cons of, of both of them, um, we, we kind of talked about that with the plastic. The sizing, though, I mean, many of you guys will ask, what size crate should I get for my puppy? We do have a YouTube video on that. I'm going to have Caitlin share that in the comments. Um, but the 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 benefit of like the metal one might be the divider that you could move as the puppy grows, whereas the plastic one, um, you're going to have to size up you know, each time your pup needs, needs a difference as they're growing, they're going to need a different size. I found with most of my plastic crates, now that we use these ones primarily, um, we've gone through two, one when they're like a puppy puppy, and then like the, you know, the next level up when they've kind of grown into adulthood. Two isn't bad. What's that? Two isn't bad if they're Who's not the lifetime of a dog? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you, you know, if you're going to have a giant, you know, like my great Dane, we definitely started with the um, the metal crate because it, it was just, she could grow into it a lot better than, we would probably go through, what, three, four of the plastic ones. So if you're having a giant breed, the metal one might be better. But 
um, just keep in mind those those scary things that your dog might find about them. You know, the sound, the jingling, the tray, that kind of stuff. We've had students, we recommended to students anyway, to put a towel underneath, not in the crate. We'll talk about why in a second, but underneath the crate to kind of absorb some of the sound um, of the, the crate rattling or the nails on the on the tray. So that's helped uh, for, for those that, you know, are worried about that with their dogs. Yeah, that's what we've had to do. We I put a, like a rug or a blanket underneath the entire thing just so that because it sits on tiles. So it's kind of, you know, oh, yeah, I'm kind of noisy. Yeah. Even our um, plastic one sits on a, on a rug as well. It just it makes it cozier um, and it does absorb that sound just a little bit more. All right. So how are we going to work on this? How are we going to help our pup have a positive association with the crate? Well, the very first thing is, if you can, if you can try to use sleepy time in your favor when your pup is already sleepy, that's kind of the first step. You know, there are a lot of other things that we're going to talk about, but trying to trying to watch the schedule and put them in the crate before they fall asleep out of the crate. That would be very helpful. We definitely don't want to move a sleeping puppy or wake a sleeping puppy. That could, that could create negative associations with being touched while sleeping. Um, you might have a pup that reacts. I know if I'm woken up, I startle a little bit and I don't, I don't like to be woken up. I don't know about you, Allison, but same would apply for puppies too. Yeah. They just don't like to be startled. They become reactive. Yeah. We do hear that from time to time. People will ask a question about, you know, my puppy is growling at me when I'm moving her. Um, you know, I'm trying to get her to not do something that, um, you know, is unsafe. And so I move her out of the way and she growls. And we have a whole video on kind of body handling. But, you know, that's partly the importance of training so that we can ask our puppies to do things without having to physically move them. What, do you, what is that? It's opposition ref reflex, is that, that kind of automatic, yeah. like, mm, you know. Yep. To pull they away. pull one way, they want to pull away. We all have it. I mean, if somebody were going to, to go grab you, you're not just going to be like, oh, hey, here's my arm. You're going to be like, hey, what are you doing? Right? You're going to automatically kind of pull away from them. So it is natural that if your pup was sleeping, you go to kind of pick them up. You, like I said, you're they're either going to kind of move away from you and or potentially use those little uh, lamb sharp teeth that they may have. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want to create negative associations with you approaching, touching, picking up when when you need to so that's the thing with this um training is because you know the pups obviously aren't verbal we have to do so much with association and so if we're now kind of bothering them when they're sleeping and putting them in the crate they're like i don't know what's happening but i am annoyed every time they put me in here because i was asleep so oh, yeah. you know now we're kind of kind of working against ourselves in terms of the crate training so if you always try to think about it like i want the experience with the crate to be positive and I have to work slowly enough that it, it it is positive. But if I work slowly enough, it will advance to, you know, a longer period of time or even more positive experiences. Yeah. People ask us all the time, too. What about this feeding meals in the crate? You guys have all heard that one before. Feed that, you know, if you feed their meals in the crate, it could create a positive association. And, and that, for the most part, is true. However, if your pup is having a negative experience with the crate, and you're trying to use food to make a positive experience, we could actually create a negative experience with food. And then they're not going to want to take it from you or, or you can't use it then for other things like training purposes, traditional stuff like teaching, sit down, stay, that kind of, that kind of thing. So we say, try it out, feed a part of a meal in there. We don't want you forcing them to eat their entire meal in the crate, especially if they're stressed. You might find feeding near the crate. So outside of the crate, but, you know, maybe it's near the crate might be more beneficial. Um, Allison, how did you do that with, did you feed any uh, meals to Lincoln? Yeah, we mostly did. We mostly did the games, um, you know, where we would encourage him to go in. We would give treats when he was in. Um, he really likes those a lot. He's very much like if you're engaging with him, he's super happy to do that. But, you know, it was funny. I was doing a little game with him last night where I was hiding his dinner around in different places. And I had kind of hid it in a little cubby in my husband's office and I kind of put it towards the back. And so Lincoln was like, he was kind of trying to get it, but he was trying to keep his body out of it because he wasn't very comfortable maybe going into this cubby area. So I watched him for a while and he continued to try to get it. And then he pulled back and he sat down. 
And he was like, nope. nope. And he looked up at me and I'm like, okay. So I moved that, that treat closer to him, but still within the cubby so that he still had to kind of figure out a way to get it but he wasn't kind of being pushed so far back. And I think we have to kind of keep those things in mind with crate training too, is watch that body language and, you know, make it a positive and fun experience, but don't push too far too fast. Yeah. Which brings us to this point here, do fun training games in and around the crate. So inside our 30 day to puppy perfection program, we have a number of games to play to introduce the crate as a positive experience to start working on building up duration in there. So your pup stays in the crate a little bit longer, building up so that you can actually step away from the crate without them kind of panicking or, or stressing out that you're not there with them any longer. So things are done in, in stages or steps and we're phasing things in um, as opposed to just kind of a full on, you know, uh, rip the bandaid off effect. We don't want to do that when we're working on crate training, especially for a dog it's a little cautious, apprehensive, or just hates the crate altogether. So this is where we say we're slowly increasing distance and duration um, when we're working on crate training. So mm -hmm. I would say um, the other thing too is when you're, when you're introducing these kinds of games, don't think of it as a linear progression where it's just like, we're going to, you know, just continually add on more minutes or, or hours or whatever it may be. In the very beginning, when we play the Mississippi game, that's in module one of the of the 30 Day to Puppy Perfection uh, course, we're actually bouncing around. We might start with a couple of seconds um, and then maybe go back down to like one or two and then increase it to like 15 to 20 seconds and then bump back down to um, or drop back down to like five to 10 or something like that and increase a little slower that way. And some of you might be going, are you kidding me going that slow? It actually, in the very beginning, when you work, work on it that way, it helps you to increase the duration in greater numbers going forward. But if you if you try to put them in there for 20 minutes at a time to start and they're panicking and they're freaking out and they're like, please let me out of here. You have a lot of work to undo that association that you've created. That would be a negative association. So we say in the beginning, smaller increments are better and you will be able to see um, a, a greater result and move along a little faster when you start that way. So um, Michelle, I know this question comes up. I can't remember if you have a slide on it, but so what do you do with the puppy while you're working on these games and you're creating a very good association with the crate and you're kind of taking it nice and slow, but what happens with the puppy when you can't supervise? And we know we wanna kind of restrict their freedom a little bit while they're potty training. So what do you do in the meantime? Yeah, I mean, you could you could set the crate up in a puppy pen so that they have access to still go in and out of the crate, but it's a smaller space. Or if you don't have a puppy pen, you can just block off a smaller room um, and keep the crate in there that way. And then, of course, we're here's the deal. We're going to be working on crate training outside of the time that we need it. So it's not just when you need to put them in there because you have to leave or you have a meeting or you know, you, you just got to get some stuff done around the house. We have to set aside the time to work on crate training outside of that, that moment that you're like, okay, we got to, we got to go in here now. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to kind of cover some tools that might be helpful for you guys with the crate training process. And that could, that could be beneficial as you go through this as well. So we always recommend um, a variety of different things to really help the, you know, the, the crate become this positive place. The first thing would be this Adapto product. It's a, it's a, you know, kind of like a pheromone that the mother dog would give off to calm her pups. Um, we recommend that you plug this in, you know, as soon as possible. Um, if you haven't brought your puppy home yet, uh, you know, obviously a week or two beforehand would be ideal to really get that in the atmosphere, in the environment. Um, if your pup is home already, plug it in and uh, you're probably going to start to see at least a little bit calmer behavior maybe in the next two weeks. This isn't a light switch effect, guys. I just want to stress that out. You're not going to be like plugging it in and all of a sudden your dog is going <sighs> to... <laughs> it's not going to be that fast. Um, but what it is, is it's really helping to kind of take the edge off, just like the mother would do for her pups to help calm and soothe them. We also recommend calming music, doggy calming music. You can literally type in here on, on YouTube, doggy calming music, or say Alexa, play doggy calming music. Um, it's specifically designed for dogs to just kind of keep them in a, 
think of the spa for you guys, right? You walk into a spa, they're not playing country or rap or heavy metal or something like that. They're, it's relaxing. You like immediately walk in and you're like, oh, this is nice. That's the kind of atmosphere that we want to create for our dogs. Um, giving them something to lick. Licking has been proven to kind of decrease stress and anxiety. So giving them something to lick and chew while in the crate could be very beneficial. So you could be, you could give them a frozen filled Kong or a Westpaw topple. For our brand new puppies, the Westpaw topple tends to work a little bit better. Um, it's a little easier for them to get stuff out of. The Kong might be a little more difficult for some puppies. We do have a whole video on what you can put in the Kong, um, some ideas and things like that. So you can take a look at that. We're not going to put anything that could be easily torn apart or shredded or ingested in there, is in like stuffing, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So Nyla bones, Benna bones, those type of things could go in there as well. Um, the, the only one that we would say you could try and we highly recommend, I'll have Caitlin share the link to the uh, snuggle puppy. Everybody loves the snuggle puppy. The puppies love the snuggle puppy. The humans love the snuggle puppy because it helps calm their pups. Um, but it's very much like your pup snuggling up to a litter mate um, or even the mother. It has a mechanical heart in it um, that you could you know, just turn on, put in the crate and let your puppy snuggle up against it. Uh, the catch is that if your puppy starts to chew on it, it's ideal that you take it out and put it on top of the crate so that the heartbeat can still be heard and felt, a little vibration of it, but your pup then can't chew the snuggle puppy. Mm -hmm. While we're on that topic of the soft things, let's just take um, Christine's question here. Um, are you putting the puppy in a completely empty crate? No bedding. And uh, Loon also had a similar question of um, what about chew proof bedding? Yeah, yeah. Those are really good questions. Here's the deal, guys. I know I get I get hated for <laughs> I get the hate for this, but with our puppies, we don't want to put anything soft and squishy in there because it can encourage them to go potty in there. And then we start to have a really a bad habit forming of going potty in the crate. The other thing is, again, our puppies start typically chewing or going through the teething phase starting at about nine to 12 weeks, somewhere in there, which means that if we have bedding in there, it could easily become a hazard and a blockage that needs to be surgically removed if your pup starts chewing on it. And I know people are like, but Michelle, he's sleeping on the on the plastic tray of the, the floor of the crate. Yes, our dogs lay all over the floors all the time and they fall easily asleep. They're just fine. I would rather your pup be safe than have an emergency surgery for blockage uh, because they chewed on something. Here's the deal. We're not saying no bedding in there forever. We're saying no bedding in there while they're going through the chewing phase and while they're still working on teaching, you're teaching them to go potty outside. So potty yeah. training phase. Once they're beyond that, you know, Pickles, he was, what I say? He was three. He was three when he could be trusted with a bed in his crate. Now for some, that could be way sooner, a year maybe. Most yeah. of them about a year or older. That's when we start to see that they're trustworthy enough to have a bed in there. Yeah, and you Lincoln would test it out. It. Oh, Lincoln could do it at about one. Um, and he also was not a huge chewer after we kind of got past teething. Um, and so I first started with a, I mean, they say chew proof, but I'm not sure anything is truly chew proof, especially no. those of you who have super chewers. They're like, ah, challenge accepted. But, <laughs> uh, but we did start with something that was a little, you know, harder to chew and not very satisfying. And he just didn't even touch it. And But we didn't start that until he was about one. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've definitely tried um, the indestructible beds. There's some really good ones out there. Um, but, but our boarding dogs have proven that they are definitely not uh, chew proof. So they, they easily chewed right through them. <laughs> we were like, Whoa, yeah. this is like guaranteed not to be chewed through. So I did just want to tell this funny story just this morning in the group, somebody posted a picture. They had a, they have a boxer. Maybe he looked like he was maybe five or six months old. And they had this lovely little bed for him. And like they said, woof on it. It was nice little pillow, yep. super comfy, all nice and plush. And he was laying next to it on the floor, <laughs> which is like, you know what? Sometimes they like that feel of that cold tile. They like to spread out a little bit. Maybe it's not like perfectly, perfectly comfortable the way they want it. They really do just fine 
on the on the tray or the bottom of the crate. And then like Michelle said, you can add in those fun beds later when they are trustworthy. Yeah. The only exception I would say um, is if you have a crate that the tray is underneath, but they're laying on like the grate of the crate, meaning the, the metal bars, yeah. that would be a no. We definitely don't want that. Not only is that uncomfortable, but that's not safe because nails can get caught in the, the bottom of it. So that's why that plastic tray is important to have that goes that they would be laying on. Not, yeah, I mean, not you the want them to have a flat surface at flat least. Surface. It doesn't right. have to be padded, but right. it should be flat. And I do think that as they get older, and certainly senior dogs who have some aches and pains, it is helpful for them to have some really soft bedding so that they're not kind of um, irritating their joints on the floor. But we're talking much, much older. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so while they're puppies, it's really going to be okay, and it's going to be much better for them to keep that uh, that safety hazard out of the crate for now. Yeah. Some other tools um, that might be helpful for you guys. So here's the deal: we we do recommend that you cover the crate. Um, not all dogs like it though, and, and we understand that. So for those guys, you don't want to do that, meaning they just get stressed when you do cover it. For many, and even the majority of them, covering the crate can really help decrease the amount of stimuli so they can rest and relax or settle in a lot better. So if you are covering the crate, this is key, the thing that you put over the top of the crate needs to be bigger than the crate so that when you put your sheet over the top of that, the sheet does not touch the sides of the crate and, and can easily be pulled in by a puppy that wants to chew on it. So if you've ever put something over the top of the crate and your puppy has chewed it, it's because the thing on top wasn't big enough. So. I would say if you can cover that um, with like, this is a, a, a cork board or a piece of cardboard or a piece of plywood, something again, that's bigger. And I cover it on the front and the sides and I leave the back open for airflow. So we're not like over, you know, we're not overdoing it. We're not suffocating them. Um, I tend to move the crate up against the, you know, the wall, as you can see in here, it's kind of towards a corner. And then I would put the sheet over the top of that. So if for some reason your dog is, you know, if they're too warm, you could have a fan that oscillates against the back of that wall and then create some nice airflow. Or if they're too cold, you know, you don't, you don't have it in a place where there's airflow. Um, another possible, you know, tool to use would be a white noise machine. So we talked about calming music. A white noise machine can be really helpful to drown out sounds outside that your puppy might be tuned into that or that is causing stress so maybe you have down the road on your street somebody's getting their roof done so that's a lot of hammering and you know construction like work so we would make sure that the white noise machine was between the dog and that outside wall or window where that noise is coming from we found um, that was really important when lincoln was about five months old which is when i hear a lot about puppies who are kind of waking up early he seemed to be very tuned into, I think the neighbor was going to work at that time, you know, the kind of the neighborhood was starting to wake up. And so we had a fan that we put in between where the crate was and the outside window. And we had that fan going not at him, but it just kind of was pointed at the wall. So it just created this noise that kind of muffled everything. And we had a really um, dark crate cover. Yeah. Kept it super dark in his little crate and um, and uh, that really seemed to help him sleep just a little bit later. Nice, comfy, cozy. All right, let's talk about something that's that we get a lot of questions about. This is the, um, is my dog panicking? Are they, are they separation anxiety? What's happening here? So there is a difference between, um, you know, the crying or fussing and the panicking. Um, the first thing you need to do, though, is just make sure all your dog's needs have been met before you're putting them in the crate. So we want to make sure they've gone outside to go potty. They're not hungry. They've been well fed. They've been exercised. They've had engagement with you. Um, you've given them some sort of enriching activities throughout that wake window, the time that they can be awake. Um, licking, chewing, sniffing, foraging, digging, those kinds of activities. And if all of those needs have been met, and you're putting your dog in the crate and you know you've gone you've already done the crate training games that we recommended and then you start to see that they're they're fussing 
I would recommend that you, this is where we need to learn our dogs just a little bit. When you first come home, you're still learning about them. So you don't know if it's really a, a panic or if it's a, a, just a fuss. Usually panic is scratching at the crate, drooling, howling, you know, consistently, not letting up. Um, they're not able to settle. They're, they're kind of frantically moving around in there. If that's happening, we definitely need to get them out immediately. So we want to make sure we're taking them out. We take them outside to go potty because that stress is causing the system to process and they might need to go again. So get them outside. Um, we want to get them to a decompression, like just sort of decompress from that stress. So we're not going to take them out and then come back in and put them right back in again. You might be spending some time with them just with the lights low, the calming music's on. You might be just sitting with them for a few minutes. Then you might attempt to put them back in there after it depends. It could be five minutes. It could be 10 minutes. It could be longer. Um, again, making sure that you've uh, given them something positive in there. Maybe it's the Kong or the West Paw Tapel. Gave them a treat to make that positive association. Maybe you didn't have a cover on and you need to put the cover on. Um, there's a variety of things that could have gone on that, that caused the dog to be stressed in there. Allison, remember, what was it? Like two weeks ago, we were working with a student um, and we determined that the location of the crate was actually the thing that was causing the dog the most stressed in the crate. They, they were like shocked to realize that this location, you want to talk about that? Well, it was, it was the location, which was one factor, um, which uh, she had um, the crate in the laundry room, which I know for many people is a great smaller space kind of tucked away. But if you think about it with the dog's sense of smell, you know, even if you're trying to use, you know, those detergents that don't have a lot of smell, it can still just be a lot of really strong uh, smells in there. But also this particular dog didn't like to be so far from the humans. And so they decided to change the crate and put it on the main floor, but then kind of help teach the pup, you know, hey, you might hear some activity with the kids, but you're still, you know, kind of calm and settled in there. And they really use the crate cover for that uh, for that purpose. The, the challenge is, is that it, it really involves a puppy detective when things aren't quite going right. What is it? Is it what's happening during the wake time? Is it, you know, how the puppy feels about the crate? Is it the crate location? Is it the tools that I'm using or not using? There's so many factors and that's partly why people usually come to us at the pro level of the online course when they're having crate challenges because we can dig into that with them and kind of give them the benefit of the experience that we've had yeah. helping a lot of people with it. Yeah. Speaking of, of, you know, stresses and, and anxieties and things, I want, I want to have Caitlin share with you guys the link to one of the most recent videos we did on separation anxiety versus um, separation distress. There is a difference. So I think just when you guys are trying to figure out what is happening with your dog, we can't see it. We're not there with you. I mean, like Allison said, our, our pro level students share that with videos with us in the, in the student group. So then we do have access to see that and evaluate. But for you guys at home, I want you to watch that video and start to ask yourself the questions that are in that video. Is the dog doing this? Is it, does it look like this? Have I done this? And that could be really helpful as you're working through this with your puppy. Ooh, I do I just want to wonder. <laughs> I've, been, I've been hearing a little bit of it. I, I'm kind of jealous. I really like a good storm. Lincoln's <laughs> like, no, thank you, but I, I'll take one. <laughs> I just want to mention to people if you're if you're in the throes of this and you're like, wow, this is, whoo, this is a whole lot. You know, it's kind of emotional on your heart. If your puppy is upset, you're not sure you're ever going to get your life back. Am I ever going to go to the grocery store without having to have somebody here with my dog? It does get better with time, with brain development, with training, with a lot of training. And it does get better the more you work on it. And, and sometimes you're like, wow, it went yesterday. I could only walk away for 10 seconds. And today he just took a nap in there for half an hour. So I just want to tell you, it's not forever, but you can really do some great things to help it move along. Uh, and we're here to help you with it. Yeah, yeah. We, we do. We, this is what we, this is our jam. This is what we love to help our students with. <laughs> yeah. Give, give me a puppy and a puppy owner who's motivated to work and we can do this. Yes. Yes. We can, we can get them really far with their training. Um, a lot of you guys ask us where to put the crate. So let's talk about that for a quick second. So um, 
I just wanted to show you this here. A few moments ago, we mentioned, you know, just the kind of crate and pen setup. So it's a, it's possible that, you know, if your pup is stressing about it, this is what that might look like using the white. We always recommend the white uh, puppy pen for inside, the black one for outside. Um, you could set it up so the crate looks like this, or if you make this even bigger, you know, and you have a smaller crate, you can just set that right in the middle. But where do we put this stuff? Where is this going to be placed? Ideally, in the very beginning, we want to place it as close to um, you know, the potty door as possible because you're going to be working on potty training. So if it's really far away from the potty door that you're heading out or you've got to go up or down a couple of flights of stairs, it could make it a little more challenging. So if you put it, you know, kind of in a, I don't want to say put it in the middle of a room that's super busy. We want to not isolate them, but we also don't want to put them in the middle of all the activity of the home. So for you know what your home looks like. You know where that might be in your home, whether it's a kitchen or a dining room or a family room that, you know, is, is used sometimes, but not all the time. So it's not isolated, but it's not in a high traffic area. Um, sometimes it is trial and error, just trying to figure out what the puppy's preference is. And that's what we were just talking about a few moments ago. The one dog um, that didn't like the laundry room really loved it when she moved it to the, the living room area. So that you know, be... she, she did a good job with that because she noticed where the dog was kind of naturally gravitating when it was nap time, like, poof, I am tired. And he just kind of would wander over to this one spot quite naturally. And so she said, well, what if I put the crate kind of over there and see how he does? And, and she really was concerned because there was pretty, pretty active area with the kids, but um, that did work a little bit better. I know she's still working through a few more things, helping the pup settle, but um, that at least was a good start to get there. And this is why it's just, oof, it takes a lot of thinking, but like we said, it's not always going to be this way. We just kind of have to work through this phase. Yeah. We also get the question um, about, well, what if I had one crate in one location and another crate in another location? So two crates. And to be honest, not that it's a horrible thing. It's just it's double the training because there's two different locations to teach your puppy to love their crate in. And so in the beginning, we always say just stick with one. It makes the training easier for you as the human and for the pup. And then once you really see your dog is confident and comfortable, then you can start to introduce another one. Yeah. Um, people ask us too, well, what about if it's in the bedroom? Well, if that is the place that your puppy feels most comfortable, then we might have to start there with the goal maybe being that we move it down to a family room or down to a kitchen area. Um, I know, a couple years ago, we had one student, um, they had to start in the bedroom, right? The, the crate started right next to their bed and slowly it moved across the room over the first, you know, week or two. And then it was outside the door. Remember that one? And she took it down the hallway. And it finally, after, um, I'm guessing like a month, she finally got the crate to go into the, um, into the family room. So that's, that's such a hard one is you're like, so should I just move it, you know, kind of incrementally or should I kind of rip off the bandaid? And this is also where yeah. it, you know, you kind of got to know your puppy a little bit. We got to do a little trial and error but we can kind of help you understand the temperament a little bit of your dog so that you can kind of make those decisions, but it, they're unique little sentient beings. So they're going to have different preferences. Yeah. that We, we determined that the rip the bandaid off effect was not a good option for her and her pup. So we yeah, did right. slow and steady. <laughs> right. Right. All right. And well, some people, I would just say some people use two crates for that. Like, okay, I'm going to transition my pup to a different area you know, I want him eventually not sleeping in the bedroom. And so they begin to introduce a second crate somewhere else and then just slowly kind of start to phase that in. That is also an option. It's such it's such a unique situation. But, um, you know, people who are really kind of tuned in to their their dog's unique personality find it pretty easy to figure it out. All right, let's let's talk about some common mistakes that our um, or maybe our viewers um, might be experiencing or might have done or we've we've helped our students correct. Um, so here's the thing: if your pup is just like reinforcing for crying in the crate, we want to try to avoid that. And I know we just talked about like, but what if they're crying? What if they're panicking? That's where again you're going to determine if it's just a fuss or cry or if it's like full on panic that they need to get out. You do have to be careful if they are just fussing, 
and you keep going to them and letting them out, they're, they're, you're, you're creating reinforcement history. They're learning that that behavior works. So if they're panicking, though, definitely get them out. If they're fussing, let's see. If, have all their needs been met? Are they, you know, it's due, they're due for this nap? Okay, let's see, you know, give them a five to 10 minutes or so to um, to kind of fuss and you'll see that they likely will just fall asleep. You can this also is- kind of note if it's de-escalating, like, yeah. you know, they're fussing and then there's kind of a quiet time and then they're like, uh, still, but still, in anyone? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's kind of quiet. So you can kind of notice, is it escalating? Is it de-escalating? Yeah. And that can kind of give you an indication of, you know, where you might be headed. Um, another common mistake is not actually working and closing the door. I'm not sure about this, where this started. Um, but we have a lot of, a lot of people that are like, and should I close the door? And the answer is yes. We definitely want you to either, if during the training process, you're building up to closing the door, that's fine. Or if you're working on this, close the door. I think a lot of people ask us, um, when will the dog wander in on their own? Um, and and feel comfortable. And maybe that's why they're not closing the door. Maybe they're concerned that the dog isn't comfortable. If your dog doesn't wander in on their own, that's okay. That doesn't mean that they don't love the crate. Pickles um, was, I mean, my goodness, how old was he? I think he said Um, he was three. I think so. Yeah. I think he was closer to three when he finally walked in on his own. Because I remember, I think we were on a Zoom or a team meeting or something. And then I went looking for him and I was like, where did he go? And there he was finally in in the crate on his own. Like I didn't ask him. He just went in there on his own. So we've had another trainer on the team. Um, Her dog was closer to one before she, Uh you know, saw her dog going in there on her own. So if your dog is not doing that, that is okay. It takes time. And it also doesn't mean your dog doesn't like the crate though. Yeah. I, I set it up in this room knowing that I spend a lot of time in here and Lincoln likes to hang out in here with me. The only comfortable spot for him is in the crate. And I made it nice and comfy for him. He's not going to chew on anything anymore because I want to encourage that still. You know, if I gave him another comfy spot to sleep, like like you gave Pickles, he would sleep there. So I'm still wanting to make sure that he feels comfortable in the crate. So I do those kind of subtle things. We have another crate in the living room that's near another desk where I work on my jigsaw puzzles. And I have a crate there to kind of encourage him, hey, if you want to hang out with me while I'm doing my puzzle, this is a good spot to do it. So I try to kind of, you know, sweeten the pot a little bit. <laughs> nice. Um, so back to the closing door. Yes, work on closing the okay. door to keep them in there. Um, if you're not practicing the crate training games enough, you're you're definitely, if you're only using the crate when you need it and you're not working on the, the skill, this is kind of like, um, you're hoping to build muscle, right? But you're not actually going to the gym consistently enough to build that muscle. So we want to make sure that we keep at it. This is something that even with my guys, older dogs, we still periodically throw in training lessons to just create that positive association, maintain, I should say, that positive association with the crate. We do not want to use the crate as punishment. So this is, if you feel like your dog has done something wrong, you putting them in there for some sort of timeout is not going to help them understand what to do differently. So we're not going to um, yell at them, throw them in there, slam the door. Those kinds of things are what's going to create a negative association. If you've gotten to the point, though, where you've said out loud, oh, my dog needs a timeout. What they really need is a nap, is a nap in the crate because they they are doing something that's, um, you know, maybe they're excessively barking, maybe they're chewing on something excessively. That's where we then have to evaluate, okay, how, where are we on the wake window? Are they well over what they can handle? And that's why they're getting into things or doing things that it's maybe frustrating you. Then we go, okay, they need a nap in the crate. Naps are definitely longer than 10 minutes. We're hoping that they're closer to an hour or longer. So anybody that says my dog needs a timeout, your dog actually needs a nap. Replace that word with nap. (laughs) And, and again, the crate is not punishment for something that they've done that we don't like, but it is a chance to say, I think you need a nap. And, you know, like we talked about earlier, the crate kind of encourages that by being small, not a lot to do, not a lot to get into. You're like, okay, well, I guess I'll just hang out here. Oh, look, I've fallen asleep. Yeah. 
All right. The other mistake that, that um, is pretty common is just not meeting the dog's needs before putting them in there. So they're in there, they're barking, they're howling, they're, you know, they're kind of fussing. You need to go through the list. Did I exercise them well enough to drain out any pent up energy? Did I give them a cool down period or cool down activity before putting them in there? This is the commonly missed one. So you've exercised your dog because you heard us say, exercise the dog. But then you didn't give them an activity to cool down, meaning a licking or a chewing, something to, to bring that heart rate down. It'd be like if you ran a marathon and then we say, OK, it's nap time. You're not, your heart is your adrenaline is pumping. There's no way you're going to be able to just fall asleep. You have to kind of come down off that high that you, you, you know, that you have naturally. So with that said, we want to make sure that we are exercising, but that we're providing the cool down activity. We want to make sure that they have had all of their needs fulfilled. That's engagement with us and species typical behaviors that they like to engage in. Like I said before, that's our shredding, digging, chewing, um, uh, foraging, things that sometimes we as humans go, well, I don't want them to do that. <laughs> digging is a common one. Um, but they're going to find a way to dig whether you like it or not. So we want to make sure we provide that positive place for them to do it. That's a whole nother lesson that I think we're going to get to uh, next week is when, aren't we talking about unwanted behaviors next yeah. week? Yeah. So you're going to want to tune into that one, but yeah. And we'll be able to take questions on that one as well. So yeah. yeah. Um, and so then the other mistake is letting your pup fall asleep outside of the crate while in the crate training process. So of course, of course, my dog, like he's outside of his crate. He fell asleep. He's older. He's well past the crate training stage. He knows he loves it. He knows it is a positive place to be. So what we're saying is during the beginning stages of crate training, use it to your advantage that when your pup is sleepy, you put them in there to fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes if you give them a choice on where they sleep, they might not choose what you'd like. <laughs> so at the beginning, you know, gently with training, don't give them a choice of where to sleep. Yeah. All right. In a moment, we're going to take some questions here. We'll scroll back through, see if there are any questions that we can help you with. Before I do that, um, if you guys haven't grabbed the new puppy starter kit, that's super helpful for our brand new puppy owners who are working on potty training, who are trying to figure out, you know, what that should they be doing with their dog when they first bring them home. Um, this is a really valuable resource. It's just a digital kit that I, I feel like, I mean, we have over... We have over 100,000 people that have actually grabbed access to this thing. So I would highly recommend if you haven't, get it. <laughs> we have, uh, as you can see, our YouTube channel is chock full of, of videos. I think there's at least 140 on here um, that will help you with everything from crate training to potty training. Um, if you want a deeper dive, though, that's all the information that we, you know, the how to, the step by step is inside 30 Days to Puppy Perfection. A lot of people ask us what's the difference between our YouTube videos and our course. Uh, there's a significant difference, actually. And it's all in, we talk about the what on the YouTube channel, and we talk about the how to do it in the course. So I think that would be the most common thing. Mm -hmm. um, this Better Puppy Behavior Workshop is also a really valuable resource for you guys interested in figuring out how your dog's brain works and how training how, how training should go. So it's an, it's an hour of your time to learn about your dog in a way that you probably never thought of. So that would be the good way to, good way to put it. Um, all right. I think with that being said, let's, let's see what we have for questions. Did we, yeah, did we have any questions that. that we didn't get to? Well, first, I just wanted to thank uh, Maple88 for the super sticker. Very nice, right? Very uh -huh. nice. We appreciate that. We have videos that come out every Thursday. We do these lives every Monday. And, you know, your support really helps us continue those. So we really appreciate that. Um, but let's take, well, let's take this one here. Um, what, if anything, would be recommended to take from the breeder, like a toy or a blanket to keep in the crate so the transition is smoother? Okay. Yes. Oh, this is an awesome one. So this, this would be where you could take that snuggle puppy um, and either send it to the breeder ahead of time. If, if your puppy is being shipped to you, we have a lot of students who have their puppies um, shipped in, um, or you could take it with you if you're you know local to your breeder and going to pick them up and allow the mother to roll around on it. You could rub it on the mom. Um, the more scent that you could bring home from the mother or litter mates could be really helpful. 
Uh, so I would say the snuggle puppy. You could probably choose like a blanket or something, but again, I don't put them in the crate. Um, I, I have put them on top of the crate and I've also put them just under the crate so they can still have the scent in that, in that space that they're in. So that would be a couple of things I'd recommend. Yeah, they can, I mean, remember dogs can smell really, really well. So even if it's not right next to them, if it's on top of the crate or you use it as your crate cover, they'll smell it. Yeah. I wanted to, to give uh, Crystal a big thumbs up while she's, she's crate training while Yay! walking. Maybe she's uh, working on some of the games or just kind of doing some fun stuff with her puppy. That's awesome. Awesome. Very Kudos. Good. Um, I think we've got, um, we talked about the bedding already, um, about chew proof bedding and, and you're right, Loon, we do recommend no bedding at all for the first few months. Yep. So, um, we can do it. We believe, <laughs> we believe it's best. Um, let's see this one. Let's see if this is a question. Amber says my five month old mini poodle is going in the crate at night, 10 PM, but then up at three. Won't go back in after a bio break, after a potty okay. break. Okay. Think? Yeah. Oh, this. So I would love to know more. And this is where where we um, would need to see a uh, schedule, what you have going on throughout the day. Because I know that there's probably something in the schedule that needs to shift around just a little bit to help our pups stay asleep longer. Um, so that could be your evening routine needs some adjusting. It could be your daytime routine. So I need to know. What activities is pup doing throughout the day? What's that evening routine look like? When is meal time, like the last meal of the day? Um, we have a pup that's five months old. So that means that we have a shift in energy levels at about the you know five to six months. We see an increase in, in energy. So I would say that we are going to need to increase the activities that our dog does during the day. Um, uh, let's see. The other thing that comes to mind is potentially a pup that's hungry. So my standard poodle, um, he definitely needs a little bedtime snack because his tummy gets upset and he actually will throw up uh, if he doesn't have that bedtime snack. So it's possible that might be it, but I would love to know more about the rest of the pup's day to help you fine tune that schedule. We do have a video, uh, maybe Caitlin can link it for us before we end for our session today. It's called uh, Nighttime Puppy Troubles. And it really does go into some of the things that might be going on, not necessarily, not always at night, but during the day that could impact what's happening at night and kind of how to get out of those kind of <laughs> nighttime shenanigans when all you want to do is sleep, your resistance is low, you'll do anything <laughs> you possibly can to yeah. get that puppy back to sleep. And sometimes we create some bad habits. So that one might be a good one for you to check out, Amber. Uh, and yep. I'll have Caitlin post that. How about, um, Elson, that other one about how to get the puppy to sleep longer too. That might be another yes, good one for her. That's a good one. That's yeah. also one that talks about for those. I swear it's a phase because we went through it too. There's sometimes these like 4.30, 5 a.m. pups. They are just ready to party. And everybody's like, not yet, not ready. Uh, that's a really good one, the how to get your puppy to sleep longer. So Amber, take a look at those two videos. See if you can get some good tips on those and uh, try a few things. Just remember that sometimes it takes a while. Training kind of needs to be consistent. So try just one or two things at first. Be consistent with it and then see if maybe you need to try something different. Yeah, Puppy training is a lot of trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. did you see what Christine said about the course? I love oh. that. Thank you. How to Train oh. a Trainer course is much more interactive and you get individualized yeah. responses from the trainers. Can't recommend it enough, particularly at the pro level. Aw, yeah. thank you, Christine. <laughs> that is the difference between, you know, like like the uh, like a YouTube video in the course, especially at pro level. We are yeah. really, I mean, we're in that group five days a week. People, you know, students ask questions multiple times throughout the day. They're submitting homework videos. They're submitting like um, just cute stuff, encouragement. Um, oh, just all sorts. And then the Zoom calls. Oh my gosh, I completely forgot about those. We have private, well, we have group, private group Zoom calls where our students tune in and we literally chat with them back and forth. Like, this is hard, right? You guys post a comment and we have so many more questions that we want to ask you, but we can't just because of the platform. But in our pro level Zoom calls, we can physically chat back and forth like Allison and I are doing right yeah. now. Yeah, it's a it's a really nice way to get to know 
you know, people who are working with their puppies, we can help them. We can get to know the personalities of the dogs. And, you know, we usually start, what's always our first question? What's the schedule of the, the puppy's day? So yep. then we can really kind of look and see, could sleep be a factor? Could it be the timing of the eating? Could it be the amount of enrichment or exercise? So sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. And that's why we get to ask a lot of questions in order to advise. Yeah. Amber said that was helpful and she's going to look at that schedule. Very good. Awesome. Okay. All right. This brings us to the top of the hour. We had an amazing time with you guys. Excellent questions that came through. Um, we'd love to help you more. So if you, if you want to join us at pro, thir, er, inside the program, 30 Days to Puppy Perfection, I think that um, Caitlin shared the link with you. Um, otherwise, maybe we'll see you on the next live that we do next week. Like I said, I think it's unwanted behavior. So mm -hmm. barking, biting, digging, that kind of stuff we're going to talk about and figure out what to do about it. Right. <laughs> All right, guys, have a blessed rest of your day. Enjoy your week and we'll see you next week. Bye, guys.